Ladies and gentlemen, now we're going to be continuing on in our investigating of market failure. My plan is, right, and I know, you know, plans will always change. Okay, that's what happens. My plan is, is that I would like us to finish the market failure topic so that we can then move on. That is my plan. Now, uh, I know that you're all very excited because in approximately 10 days, in fact, 11 days from today, good old Saint Nick will be going down your chimney. He will be eating the cookies that you have left out lovingly for him. Uh, the reindeer will get their carrots, I guess. Uh, now, how are we um, so you are expecting, I'm, I'm guessing, Christmas presents as opposed to a lump of coal, uh, I'm assuming, yeah? So in the spirit of such, this is a Christmas present for you. Yay. All right. This is the Let's Revise books, and if you have ever gone to the UK, you all have seen these, okay? Uh, there are lots of them, okay? Uh, the photocopy lady has very nicely photocopied them for me. Okay. Uh, very nicely. All right. These are my gift to you. All right. You can work your way through them. There are, hopefully, it's photocopied relatively sanely. Uh, there's lots of terminologies, etc., that we're going to come across. Uh, you can use this as your, your revision. Etc. There are some exam style questions, although I think she's cut some of them out. Yes, oh, some still there. Okay, uh, so for free for you. Okay, I'll get those. And, and free, here's yours. All right, so please, these are able to be written on by you, highlighted by you. Make annotations on them, and uh, you know, more that's fine. Pages that you are really impressed with, and blow them up. The page three and send them on the wall. Well, the trees were already dead in the first place, they're just used. So, essentially, the trees have fulfilled their purpose. Yes. All right, okay, ladies and gentlemen, let's get ourselves underway. Now, I'm going to, I've got 38, percent so that's okay. So if you can jump into the near pod, the code is ULYJ2. You can jump in there. I'm going to need to move it forward because I couldn't remember where we'd stopped. So I'm going to start all the way at the beginning. And then I'm going to push the go button. All right. How are we doing, Yang Yi? All right? Yes. I'm doing good. Fine. Good. All right. So ULYJ2. ULYJ2. If you could jump into the air for me, please. That would be fantastic. All right, I've got it in there already. Put the gear. All right, okay. I know. All right, so a little jump forwards. Now, the code is always the top left hand of the screen. Please don't panic too much about that if you have lost. There it is, the code will be there. Now we've talked quite a bit, there's been a lot of terminology that we've used, and please do review the terminology, that will be quite important. This is a major topic, and it is one that has got a lot of potential questions that can come out of it. It is also a good bedrock type theory that will be very useful for when you are beginning your IB year, and another two years time, year, year and a bit's time, year and a half time, um, that this will really help you. Right.
Yeah, did we hit me here? Yes? No? All right. Okay. Now, a lot of what we need to do as economists is critique the government. We need to say, has the government made the right decision? We need to offer up potential alternatives if we think that the government hasn't done right. But we need to be very clear about why we think the government may or may not have done a good job. Right? When there are a lot of consumers involved, right, as in the case that we are in at the moment, okay, and there are externalities aplenty, then the government should, you would imagine, get involved and help out. Now, the government has two things that can possibly happen. The first one is like a command, like the command economies that we talked about. They can have a direct control. They can leap into a market and say, this is what happens. You are now no longer allowed to buy this product, or you have to buy this product or this type of product, or that type of product, or you're not allowed to use plastic, or you are allowed to use plastic, or you must, yeah, right? They can have direct controls, either legislation, laws, rules, or even perhaps taxation, which can be a bit taxing on us. All right. The other thing that the government could do is if it's a positive externality, they might want us to consume it. So, yes, they could again, by law, say you must do this, but they could actually subsidize it. So, say, for example, the latest I've heard, March, okay, is when there will be a vaccine available here in Malaysia. That's the latest I have heard. Okay. Now, obviously, the rollout of that across the whole country is going to be a staggering feat of logistics. And we know that people like dentists and pharmacists are already applying and training as to how to do uh, injections, because there just obviously isn't enough hospitals and nurses in order to do the 15, 16 million people that there are. They're also going to have to try and figure out how to get it to the remote areas and all of those sorts of things. They're also going to have a X amount to start with, all right? Uh, he has promised that he's going to increase it from 30% of the country to 60 to 70% of the country. That would be really good. All right. And that would enable us to move on perhaps a bit quicker than if we only had 30% covered. And then it will be who gets it first. Then it will be how expensive is it? You know, it's something we want everybody to have, but in order for people to have it, Maybe the government needs to subsidize it. And that is pretty much what's going to happen. Again, just think of the logistics of trying to get that much vaccine all around the country. They've started the rollout of it in America at the moment. Okay. Massive big trucks, refrigerated trucks going across the country, about 800 or so airplanes. And they're being guarded by the. Um, what are they, the, the marshals? Right? Because you can imagine, in America there are some interesting people. Some of whom don't think vaccines are good. There are still Americans who believe, believe it or not, there are still Americans who believe that the vaccines are a conspiracy from Bill Gates and Microsoft to put a microchip in you. Yes, there are. There are still those people. So these convoys are going to have to be protected. You know, no. All right? They're going to have to be protected. Otherwise, you can imagine what's going to happen is that there's going to be a whole lot of people with big, big red hats attacking these convoys. There will be. All right. Okay. Subsidies. Maybe they should provide it for free. Or maybe for a minimal charge. But even a minimal charge, is that something that everybody's going to be able to afford? Well, we know that there's different levels of of income in Malaysia, so maybe it does need to be free. But is the government going to do that? And we don't know yet. Right, as far as I'm aware, there's been no discussion about cost. Anybody else know? Right. It will be something to consider. Right? Because you imagine how many people there are in the household where you live, each one of them needs to be injected. Yeah? Okay. 
Then what about the people who work for you? you no, know, you might have a cleaner who comes into your house. Well, is that your responsibility or theirs? Well, if you say it's not your responsibility, but they're still coming into your house, you know, they could be bringing it, you know, with them. So therefore, it is in partly your responsibility too. So then should you be paying for their, them to get their vaccine? Because they may not be able to afford it. Maybe you have more than one cleaner, I don't know. Okay. What about in workplaces? Should it be the school's job to pay for the vaccine for all the staff? What about uh, health passports? Because sooner or later, when the vaccines are rolled out, people are going to start saying, I want to fly to Singapore. I want to fly to the UK. Well, how are they going to know whether you've had the vaccine or not? Maybe there needs to be a global QR-based database on who's got the vaccine and who hasn't, and which vaccine it is, because remember, there are different types. And maybe, you know, you've got friends who've got the Russian one. I don't know about you, but I wouldn't be Russian to get that one. All right. All sorts of things to think about. How could the government intervene? Where you go? Have a guess. Have a go. Based on what we've just talked about, what could they do? Work on it. Well done. Okay, on a skill base, yeah, if you can do it with both hands, all right, if you can do it multiple times, all right, if you can then move down each finger, oh, I can't do that one because my hand doesn't bend that way, yeah, with each one. Yes, I was young once and had far too much time on my hands. Monster, yes, monster. Yes, I am. <laughs> right, how are we getting on? Good. Come on, Wenching. You can do it. Good work. All right. Now, a little bit of maths. Apologies if that was a bit loud. Your social costs, they're the cost to society. So when we see the word social, we're not thinking about how nice Darwish is to you all, no. Instead, you are thinking society. So what are the costs to society? The costs to society are made up of all of the private costs, all of the costs that are in the marketplace. Plus, any and all external costs, any costs that are outside of the market. It is a little bit of a mathsy equation, and yes, believe it or not, particularly in your multiple choice paper, they can actually ask you, weirdly enough, to do a mathematical equation like that. So you will need to know that equation, and just like the elastic ones, you're not going to be given a whole sheet with all of the equations on it. You're just going to have to have them committed to memory. Right? Put them in the filing cabinet. Yeah? And be able to recall them. So if there are social costs, costs to society, they're all of the private costs plus the external 
plus the extra outside of the marketplace costs. Similarly, any benefits to society, they're found when you add the private benefits to the external benefits, right? Private, we're talking about the ones that are in the market transaction, the supply and demand ones. They're the ones that are there. Plus anything that's external to that. Are there any questions on that? Is that okay? Yeah? All right. What are social costs equal again? Work, Tracy. Well done. Oh, got a few guys rock star. Look at that. Fantastic. Still waiting on Angie. Come on. There you go. Good. Charles, you got one down. Go. Do your social costs equal. Okay, so in the exam, as said, most likely to be seen in the multiple choice paper. And in that, it might be a case study. And within that, Okay, all right. Uh, and in that, you might have to work out firstly what they're talking about, what the case study is all about. But then you might need to figure out which ones are the external costs and which ones are the private costs, and then figure out what the social costs are. But because it's multiple choice, you should have it written there. You'll have the A, B, C, and D. When you are writing a written expanded answer, in paper two, right? These understandings can be included in your answers, right? As part of your explanation, the government puts the policy in place because there are social costs. Social costs are. However, we find that what the government does actually makes the situation worse. Right? Yeah. Now, if the government puts those direct controls in place, for example, they may put a tax in place. Well, we've seen that before. When we had our market model, we saw that when a tax was put in place by the government on production, it caused the supply curve to shift left towards the zero. A decrease in supply, which is what we want, because we want there to be less of this product in society, and we're perfectly happy to accept a higher price. So if the government intervenes, one of the easiest things for them to do is to put a tax on. Doesn't mean it's always going to be effective. And when you get to IB in another year and a half, you could actually argue that about how effective it is. You can write IAs, internal assessments, right? Where you critique this. Where you can even take apart theory. Say, well, that's what it says in theory, but in real life. Go, go. So let's have a look. It is a closed gap exercise. See how you get on. There you go.
Okay, how are we getting on? So your name, that's right. Controls and taxes raise the marginal or additional costs of production of firms. It causes the supply curve to shift to the left, thus correcting an over-allocation of resources caused by the negative externalities. Output will be reduced to what's considered by society to be an optimal level. Woo Again, in theory. All right. As we're going to discover, nothing is quite as simple as it first appears. Right, here we go. Let's imagine, in our imagining this, that we're still going to be trying to intervene. So how can we do it? Well, what if there isn't enough of these resources? What can the government do? Well, first thing they could do is they could offer a subsidy to us. We want you to buy more of this product. So let's give you a subsidy to do it. Right, kind of a weird way to do it, perhaps, but... Yeah. Uh, anybody been to the UK? Aware that the UK exists. If you go on public transport in the UK, you might have used a little car to get you on and off buses or trains. Yeah. Now those tend to be issued by the government or the local government. Similarly here, if you you can swipe to get in and out of um, uh, the train, right? In and out of the toll booths. Uh, in and out of car parks, right? You've got a little card. You've got a little card, yeah? Now, assuming that card is connected to a computer somewhere that records your data, yeah? Has to be. So why can't the government just push money into it? Well, of course, of course they can. If the government wanted to easily give you money, that would be the quickest way of doing it. If you're all attached to a database with your card, they just go... And you've all of a sudden got a hundred ringgit in your car. Woo! Yeah? Let's go jump on the metro. Apparently the metro is going to go all the way down to Singapore at some point. That's exciting. Could you imagine going from Singapore all the way up right to the heart of KL on the train? That'd be good. That'd be so good for business. I'll tell you right now. Right. They could also subsidize the people who manufacture the products. Right, they could. Now take, for example, we want more people to be educated. Okay, that's a good thing. So maybe the government could provide education scholarships, subsidizing the cost of education. That sounds a good thing. Now, I happen to know the Malaysian government does do that. I don't know how it works. I don't know who it affects. I don't know whether they're full scholarships or partial. I don't know. But I do know that they do, at least in the past, at any rate, it's not even ongoing. They do do that sort of thing. Maybe they need to do more of it. Yeah. It could be that the government provides it. Like we said about the vaccines. Maybe the government just has to give it to you for free. To make sure that you take it. Yeah. One of the problems, though, with giving something to people for free is that they tend not to view it as important. All right. It's one of the reasons why public education is always a bit of a uh, 
if you aren't financially contributing to it, you don't necessarily see the importance of it. And that is difficult because teenagers themselves aren't necessarily financially contributing to their education, right? But mum and dad might be. Okay? But just think, you know, if the government wanted more people to go to higher education, they could subsidise that too. In New Zealand, they do. But they still do to an extent. But in the past, when I say the past, I'm talking about the 1970s, so that was the past, okay? The New Zealand government used to, they were desperate to get people with doctorates, particularly medical doctors, very keen, okay? So they subsidized getting a doc, doc, medical doctor degree by up to 90% in New Zealand, back in the 70s, right? Because we wanted New Zealand growing doctors. Now that's just the cost of it. That doesn't mean you don't do the exams and learn the material. Quite clearly, you still had to do that. It just meant that people could afford to do it. Yeah? On the flip side of that, the humanities subjects, yeah, they were subsidized too, but they were only subsidized by 10%. Yeah? So we were paying about 90% of the cost of our degree at that point. Over the years, the government has reduced that right, subsidy for higher education quite a bit. Yeah. Well, what about preschool education? Do we want more preschool education or do we want more primary education? Or do we want more high school education? You know, th these are the questions that we can ask. The government's got this scarce resource of money, so where should it go? Well, Adam Smith said, that it should go to primary education. That it's more important that you learn how to read and write and do maths than anything else. Everything beyond that is extra and you should pay for it. Yeah? Okay? He also had some other interesting ideas about what the government should and shouldn't be involved with that you might actually disagree with. For example, health care. Right? wasn't a fan of the government being involved with it. Okay. If the government subsidizes consumers buying the product, they are causing that demand curve to shift to the right, which again is what society wants. We want more consumed. Potentially, again, we might be prepared to pay a higher price even. If there is under allocation of a good, should the government intervene? And if so, what should they do? Should they directly provide it? Should they offer a subsidy to producers or a subsidy to consumers? What do you think? This is just a what you think. Right, there you There we go. Right, it's quite interesting. There are a couple of you who think direct provision, so the government should provide, but the majority of you, you're either all saying that what Angie says, everybody else follows, or the majority of you independently are saying that maybe subsidies to producers is the way to do it. Now, in the slides, which you've got access to, there is a wee video clip about market failure okay, and externalities that Mr. Clifford does. Okay, they're in the site. Okay, I can, I can repost the link to the site for you. No problem. Now, 
this now is about you being critical, you deciding whether these are the best strategies or not. Now, at IGCSE level, we aren't expecting you to do university work, you know, quite clearly, all right? But at IB, we, it's pretty close, okay? All right? So we're wanting you to be able to do, use advantages, disadvantages, and come up with some overall conclusion. So if we're going to use taxation as a method, it does increase the price. Woo. It does cause quantity demanded to be decreased. It also, interestingly enough, creates a revenue for the government, which they could use to help cover those external costs. So there are two very good points that you could well explain. Plus, you might know real-life examples where the government uses taxes on a negative externality. For example, there was an article in the Malaysian newspaper just the other day where the government said it was going to increase the taxes on a demerit good. Anybody here to hazard a guess as to which demerit good it was? Basic example from textbooks. Yes. And they're also going to be putting a tax on the e-cigarettes. What are they? Are they called e-cigarettes? Whatever those things are. The weird things, they look like little tubes that they kind of blow smoke out of. Whatever those things are. They're going to put a tax on those. All right. Then, the disadvantages. So the counter-argument. Those were the good points. Yeah, woo -hoo. Right? These are the counter arguments. If it is an inelastic demand, if it's cigarettes, for example, if it's alcohol, if it's one of those products that is addictive, playing Fortnite, yeah, addictive, yeah, try getting them off it, yeah. Okay, I challenge you to take my son's iPad away from him when he's watching something that he wants to watch. I challenge you, yeah. You'll find it's a struggle. Okay. Uh, weird YouTube people. What, what, are, what are these people? And and they they are watching. So here's what it is. And again, I don't understand this. Right? These are people watching other people play video games. Then they are commenting on the other people playing the video games, recording that, uploading that. So they're not even playing the game. They're just commenting on other people playing the game. And then my son watches. It's, it's, it's quite meta when you think about it. So he's watching them commenting on somebody else playing a video game and finding it hilarious because the people who do the commentary, comment, commentating, whatever it is, okay, they're over the top with their exaggerated expressions and they, the boys do these high-pitched squealy voices and get incredibly excited about some little Minecraft person running around shooting zombies. Bows and arrows. Uh, yeah. Eh. Do not understand. All right. The, the high pitchness gets me. But it's all it's all over the top and it's all dramatic because that's what gets people's attention. It's like the um, what do they call it? Clickbait. And they'll have the video with some incredible title. Ten things they tell you about Spider-Man 3. And it's, no, it's not. It's ten rumors that somebody has suggested might be happening, and who knows. Yeah. Can anybody here in charge of Disney Plus? Why haven't I come to Malaysia yet? Come on. It's taking so long. They've officially advertised for people to work for Disney Plus in Singapore. I don't know whether that means it'll spill over into Malaysia. But the latest country to get Disney Plus is apparently Indonesia. Which is apparently the first Southeast Asian country to get it. But yeah, as you've seen, because they did a press release, Disney did a press release the other day for all of their shareholders. And they're going to be releasing this, and this, and this, and this, and this. And I'm going... All right, sounds good. 
You know, when can we see it? And it hasn't come to Malaysia yet. What? So in order to see it, you'd have to get a VPN, pay for the VPN, and then pay for the subscription. Anyway. Indirect taxes affect people who have a lower income more than the people who have a higher income. I mean, you imagine, you think about all of, say, the cigarette tax. Just take that as an example. Remember, it's inelastic. So you're not going to see as big a decrease in quantity demanded as you first thought. But who are the people who actually smoke? Yeah, it's not necessarily the people with the big incomes. In fact, if you go to several developing countries around the world and have a look on the streets, it's the, the workers right, on the building sites, okay, the people sweeping the streets. These days, they predominantly will be the smokers. All right? Okay, we lived for three years in Suzhou in China, and that's what we saw. All right? Okay, it was, it was quite scary at times. Okay? So this tax is going to disproportionately affect people on lower incomes. They don't have a big income to start with. And then you're asking them to pay more for their cigarettes. So what, where's the equity in that? What is an advantage and a disadvantage to the use of taxation to correct for externalities? Where you go? Where you that? I think it's about something like eight US dollars a month to get Disney Plus. And then you have to also pay for the VPN. I've looked into it. It's not cheap. But some of you may already have VPN, so yeah. Now I've got to ask though, if you already have a VPN. If you're not using it, to, you must be using the VPN to see internet things, TV channels, etc., that you can't see here. That would be the only reason to have one. Here. There's no, you know? yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Been there. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. When we were in China, the, the guy, have I told you about the guy who set up our television? Right, so we got the internet through our TV. The internet TV, yeah. Uh, okay. And there's a company that serves expats with regards to the internet. Because it's only expats in China who are allowed, you know, to see things that aren't strictly controlled by the media. The government so he set all of us up and at some point in time we started having problems with him so we kept you know sending him messages because that was the best way because we couldn't speak mandarin okay and we'd send a message after message and we got no reply none so we ended up getting a friend of ours who spoke mandarin to ring him ring the company and when he rang the number of the company he spoke to some of the people there and they said he'd been arrested Okay, because he'd sold the package for expats to some Chinese people, right, and that's against the law, right? So he then got arrested and taken away to be re educated, right? The company got dissolved, but the people who worked in the company basically moved across the road and set the company up again, right, under a different name, okay? So then they came and sorted out our TV for us. But it is actually quite a difficult thing for them to do because they had to navigate that idea of expat versus Chinese. But in the city that we lived in, there were also expats who were married to Chinese citizens. So the problem then became who officially has the contract. 
So if it was the expat, it was fine. But if it was their spouse, not fine. Yeah, and that's where the problem. Is. Yeah. Off. That might do it. All right, good. Have a good chance. Um, Mr. David. Okay. Yeah. Here. Oh, uh, Sorry, uh, I want to ask, like, just how you said about the disadvantages, right? And then yeah. there was one that says um, indirect taxes affect lower income individuals. Yes. Where is that? I don't, I don't really understand what that means. Yeah. Absolutely. Good question. Right, let's imagine uh, an imagining what I'm going to Let's imagine you earn a hundred ringgit. That's your entire income. And there is a tax on the cigarettes that you buy. And as a result of that tax, you have to pay 10 ringgit. Okay, let's just imagine that. So that works out to be 10% of your income. You see that? Okay. But if you were earning a thousand ringgit and you were paying the additional ten ringgit, that works out to be what percentage? One percent. So if you're earning more, you're paying proportionally less of your income in tax because of the indirect tax. So essentially these taxes, some argue they're, they're actually a tax on the poor. That poor people are overburdened with this. And if you consider that you know these are the people who possibly don't have an education that allows them to earn a higher level of income in the first place, all right, they may not ever get that, then essentially you are, you know, double penalizing them. So should you do that? And it gets even worse when you consider things like access to health care and all of the other sorts of things that you possibly want. So equity and issues surrounding that are huge. And we're not necessarily talking just developed, developing countries because the country with the most unequal level of income in the world is actually the United States of America. All right. The reason why it is is because there are people like the Jeff Bezoses of the world, who is the richest man in history, and then there's everybody else. You got four or five people who are earning multi-billion dollars worth of income. Okay. Then you've got everybody else working like five five jobs in order just to make ends meet. And if you haven't ever traveled to America, you don't at the moment. <laughs> but if you go to cities like New York or LA, you will find it is rather expensive to try and live there. Yeah? Well, imagine trying to do that on a salary that's quite low. Right? And also remember that there's a large percentage, a large percentage of Americans who don't read. Not that they can't read necessarily, it's that they don't. Right? It is quite scary. 20% of Americans cannot identify America on a map. Right? They see a map of the world and they say, where's America? I don't know. Yeah? The level of education for some parts of America is really scary. This is one of the reasons why, well, we understand what's happening at the moment. It's happening. So therefore, they're trapped in that low-income cycle, and that's something that we're going to discuss uh, next year. All right. So does that help, Tracy? Yes. Thank you. Good. All right. All right. 
There are lots of rules and regulations that are command-based decisions that should be in place. Okay? That they don't have to be a tax. It could be something as simple as a minimum age. Yeah? In New Zealand, the minimum age for buying cigarettes used to be, believe it or not, 21. All right? Because as you're probably aware, that was considered the age at which you turned into an adult. So a lot of old laws were 21 based. Yeah, like voting, driving, all of that. But over time, they've all changed and, and reduced. Then that age got reduced in New Zealand down to 18. And now it is officially 16. Yes. I have no idea what it is here. None. If there is a law, even. I don't know. Yeah. The argument in New Zealand was if they're old enough to drive, because in New Zealand they're old enough to learn to drive at 16, Scary, I know. Can you imagine a 16-year-old driving? Woo! Scary. <laughs> All right. Okay. Then they can do that. But then the argument is, well, they're allowed to drive. They can buy cigarettes. Why can't they vote? Because in New Zealand, you can't vote till you're 18. I don't know. Again, I don't know what the age is here. I don't remember the politicians putting the laws in place that affect you all. So maybe you want to be able to vote for that. Laws regulating where and when you can drive. Laws about vaccinations. Right. I'm going to bet that fairly soon countries when the vaccine starts being rolled out are going to say you're not allowed into our country if you haven't been vaccinated. They're also going to start saying you can't come into work if you're not vaccinated. You're not allowed to go to school. If you're not back, they're going to have to. Yeah? So those laws potentially are coming. That's why I'm wondering about some sort of digital passport system so you can go verify. Yeah? Like the QR system that we have at the moment, the My, My Gerata, Gerata, however we say it, I don't know. Yeah? That one. It's a brilliant system. It really is. They have a similar system in New Zealand and pretty much nobody uses it. To the extent where the New Zealand government is so worried that they've basically given up on the idea. And instead, they're moving to a different system, which is called remote tracking, where they track you based on the Bluetooth connection in your phone. Which some might argue is actually more invasive than just scanning a QR code. Uh, apparently, your iPhones have the ability to do this already. Everybody's does. Right? It's just a matter of it, you can't actually do it, right? because it's not turned on. Uh, but in America, it is turned on. And in New Zealand, that's what they're looking at at the moment. But there are lots of privacy issues that they're currently discussing. Because New Zealanders don't do the QR code scanning thing. So in order, if they, w are, they are worried, about, obviously, about outbreaks. So this is a way to do it. Wearing a helmet on a motorbike. I don't know how many people I've seen without them. I didn't know if it's a law here. I have no idea. Seat belts and cars. Again, is it actually a law here? Hmm. How many times have you seen little children sitting on dad's lap whilst he's driving? Yeah. Banning night flights at airports. What about alcohol sales? Yeah. Well, think about Malaysia, what the government has done with regards to the sale of alcohol. Yeah. So it's possible to do it. Keep an eye on that. I'm going to move this. Sorry, please. Over here. It's okay. I know you can't see it very well, but you'll be able to see it on your screen. All right. All right. Okay. Now, and there are lots of others. Do they work? Do rules, laws, regulations, do they actually work? I mean, here in Malaysia, everybody seems perfectly happy to do a QR thing. Yeah? Seen that, from what I see. But in America, whew, yeah, America was to put a, a law in place about wearing masks. Can you imagine? They will all kick off. They're kicking off at it being voluntary. 
Why doesn't it work? Does it work all the time? What's the problem with it? Are there any examples that you know of where laws are in place but they don't work? What is the problem with the law? Or is it the people and their understanding of it? So therefore, what we're trying to say is, in theory, the government can do this. But in reality, it may not be effective. Because why? Swearing. What's the legal age? Is there like a law in anybody know Korea? Is there a law with regards to going to school in Korea? Is like a certain age? You must go to school by this age? Oh yeah, you have to go to like to middle school. So what age are you thinking this? <laughs> it's been too long. Because I less care about it. What about finishing school? Is there an age that says you must finish school by this age? Or are you allowed to just stay at school forever? Okay. I don't think you do because like it's kind of mandatory for us to go to elementary school at a certain age. Yeah. So I don't think there's like a certain age that we have to, you know. Well, interestingly enough, I had a kid who was Korean in China, and he had to repeat his first year of IB. Reasoning being, he was wanting to get into a Korean university. And the rule at that particular Korean, maybe it's all, I don't know, was that you had to have done a certain amount oh, of yeah. education. Yeah. before they let you in. So it's not necessarily what you've done, it's that you have to have done this many. Mm -hmm. right? That's quite a different rule in any other parts of the world. Do you feel like they test to like for graduation kind of thing? If they didn't attend the school, they can take the test to the certified to keep graduating. Would it surprise you to know that there are some learners here at school who are 19? Not necessarily in your year group, yeah. Like that, but there are some learners who are possibly touching on twenty. In New Zealand, the maximum age, maximum age that you can be at a high school in New Zealand is eighteen. After that, you have to leave. Yeah. Why do you think New Zealand does that? Because of the sports teams, absolutely right. Because what schools would do is they would just keep their students back another year, and then another year, and then another year. Right? Now, um, if you haven't been to New Zealand before, Nice, nice place. All right. One of the other things to be aware of is that sometimes the Pacific in the Pacific Islands they don't actually register your birth until you're five. All right. So some of the Pacific Island learners who you'd be playing against in a sports team would actually technically be five years older than you. Would be up to five years older. Yeah. So I had an under. What was it under four? No, under under sixteen basketball team. So these kids in this basketball team, some of them were thirteen, some of them were fourteen, all right? One or two, fifteen, but not beyond that. Okay, and they were playing a team from South Auckland, and one of the boys in the South Auckland team was six foot eight, and he had a full beard and moustache. <laughs> Okay, and he was legally, he was 13 years old. 
13. They came from the islands and there was an issue okay, with the registration of his birth. It was in the islands, they said. Okay. So you can imagine then how old he might have actually been. And if the school decided to keep him in school until he was 19, how much bigger and stronger he would be than the rest of the cohort. So just think of those rugby teams. Yeah. Think of some of those big boys in those rugby teams. And they're allowed to be at school for another year and then another year. And, then, yeah. and yes, there were lawyers involved and all sorts of things that would go on. You can imagine that. Had one basketball coach from a different school. Okay. And he would scout basketball players. And then he would become that basketball player's legal guardian in order to move them so that they would come and play in his school. Yeah. All right. He would bring back players back into school, this is why the rule came in, who were over 19 come and play in his basketball team, including his son, who was officially at university at the time. But he then got Oh, I'm at school again. Yeah, there were some interesting practices. All right. Good thinking. Well done, team. All right. Now, here are some advantages and disadvantages of those rules and regulations. So, it might lead to a reduced consumption. Put a rule in place that says you're not allowed to consume this product until you're a certain age, for example. It should lead to... By the way, the, 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 the rule that caused the biggest decrease in smoking, do you know what it was? It was the ban on advertising on television and the movies. That had the biggest effect on decreasing smoking consumption. Because the people who that affected were your age. And the point being is that your age, or and younger, then didn't start smoking. So that led to a longer term decrease in the number of people smoking, because they didn't see it. You know, they didn't see it on the TV, they didn't see it in the movies, so therefore it wasn't appealing to them. Whereas before that, remember, we're talking a time period where cigarette companies were sponsoring sports teams. Now that's a different thing I saw. Alcohol teams. Alcohol sponsoring sports teams. They still are. Some of the biggest sponsors of the Super Bowl is Heineken and Budweiser. Bit of a disconnect with that, yeah? It's like, I don't know, Coca-Cola sponsoring the Olympics. Oh, they do. Right. An awareness of the negative impact. It might be an advertising campaign about drinking and driving. All right. It might be the awareness of positive impacts. So you must get this health thing done. Yeah. Sometimes it's just about the information. People just don't know. Yeah. The disadvantage is it might lead to illegal markets. Okay, someone did suggest to me that there was an underground economy for cigarettes in Malaysia. Hmm. Apparently there is. All right. I seem to be all looking over in this particular corner. I'm not entirely sure why. But all right. All right. There's an there's an underground or black market, a market that is illegal. All right. The government has no control over it. The products may be less quality all right. it's kind of like going here yeah, dude here's some petrol we'll put this in your car that way you don't have to go to the service station Shh, it's cheaper what are you actually putting in your car do you know oh, okay. we'll all right <laughs> a disadvantage is that people are going to try and break the rules they are we know this you see it there's a speed limit on the road 
Okay. Yeah. People will. Even if it is you're not allowed to sell this product to these people because they're too young. If they offer you some money, you're probably going to sell it, aren't you? You want the money. Yeah. You also are going to have to enforce it. You put a law in place. This is the tough thing. Any rule or regulation that you put in place, you have to enforce as the government. So at the SOP here, on the radio as we were coming in, there were apparently a whole lot of people who were fined for not following the SOPs. Yeah. Well, you've got to send the police to check, you've got to you know, take them to the court, you know. Yeah. And that's time and money that that costs. And the, the stronger the rule, the more enforcement that you're going to need to have, or the more resistance there is. Yeah, I mean, I honestly, I had a year eleven tutor group a uh, couple of years in a row, basically, and they were really upset about uh, hooded sweatshirts. I don't know if this has come up with your age group. I don't know, but there's a rule. Uh, there is actually a school rule about hooded sweatshirts, about what you're allowed to wear and what you're not allowed to wear. And there's a whole big thing about you know. The tutors have to enforce this. Yeah? Well, somebody's looking the rule. What about using your cell phone when you're walking around? There is a school rule about that. Yeah? Using your laptop outside of the classroom? There's a school rule about that. By the way, there's actually also a school rule about having your cell phone on the desk. Interesting. Yeah. Who's, who's going to enforce this? Yeah. Some will, some won't. What happens then? Yeah. We had one in New Zealand in the school, one of the schools I was at, and it was about the uniform coat. Any of them, right? Now this one was how many earrings you were allowed in your ears. All right. This is New Zealand, you can imagine. Okay? So the rule was you're only allowed one earring. Well, whew, boy, did they kick off at that. But then, of course, they decided to try and protest it. Right? Oh. So then it was, okay, one earring, but it's this big. Right? Like chandeliers hanging from your ear. <laughs> so then you have to modify the rule as to what the type of earring that you're allowed is. Yeah? Then it was, of course, some of the boys got upset because then it was, well, it's gender biased. Oh. Okay. And then the rule didn't specify where the earring was. So then they're putting them through their eyebrows, <laughs> putting them in their nose. Yeah. It's like, well, okay, so then you're not allowed this and you're not allowed this. You start adding all of these, you're not allowed. Yeah. All right. One day we had the girl turn up to school. It was a, a musty day. Do you know what a musty day is? Yeah. A casual clothing day. Okay. And she turned up to school and she dyed her hair half of it black and the other half pink. All right? It's better. Then she decided, but she was an interesting young lady, okay, that she was going to get these metal spikes, that yay long, and she stuck them through her throat. Like that, the skin in her throat. All right? It was, I don't know, some sort of trend, I guess. Yeah, and I'm walking around school like, yeah, dear, you just cut me off. Go on. Yeah. We had a rule about, they used to put like metal uh, bolts, and they used to put them in their tongues. Oh, why on earth would you want? Okay, let's move on why, okay? But it was very common. And of course, we have to have a rule about that. Well, can you imagine being a teacher trying to tell someone to take the stud out of their tongue? Right? Uh. All right, uniform regulations. Um, in, in the school that we were at in New Zealand, we actually had boys sent to the hairdresser. We actually put them in the car and send them to the hairdresser. Sometimes we wouldn't let them back in the school until they had their hair cut. But the rule was you had your hair had to be off your collar. Yeah? This one I need to. Yeah, yeah. Alright. So you would have had fun. Yeah. Um, 
I mean, we had official school shoes that you had to wear. Did you have anything else? I mean, how difficult is it to enforce those sorts of things? Think about it. Am I going to go up to someone with a pair of scissors and go, no? What are you going to do? Yeah. Um, the other one was the length of the skirt that the girls wear. Yeah, considering that, okay, because this is New Zealand and yeah, there were some issues. Okay, some of the girls thought that wearing a belt was the same as wearing a skirt. Well, that's not a skirt. I'm sorry, it's a belt. Yeah. So all of those things had to be enforced. All right. Then it was okay. Let's the uniforms all sorted. But then what happens when it's a casual clothing day? You had to then have rules about what was appropriate casual and what was inappropriate casual. So what slogans are you allowed to and words are you allowed on the t-shirts when you turn up to school? And yes, there were some interesting ones that they came up with. Yeah. And again, you've got exactly the same problem, that's the length of the skirt, yeah? And then there were some boys who said, well, genderist, and then they came in skirts. Yes. Okay. <laughs> but the weirdest one was the girl that we had to send home because she came to school in her swimming costume. <laughs> it was a nasty day. <laughs> now, when I say swimming costume, I know you're all thinking, swimming costume. No, 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 no. When we're talking swimming costume in this context, we're talking not a whole lot of costume. All right? Much more her than there was costume. Okay? Now, it was quite weird because she was an identical twin, okay? And the other sister just came in normal muffy. So you kind of think, what's going on at your house? <laughs> so, yeah, she, had to get, she got sent home because that was way appropriate. <laughs> It's like, whoo, no, go home, one next, okay, we'll change, okay? So if you've got a rule in place that the government has said, whether it's age restrictions, whether it's speed limits, whether it's, you know, products that you're allowed or not allowed, somebody has to enforce it, yeah? Otherwise, it's not a rule. It's just a suggestion, yeah? And then how much does that cost? So... What are the advantages and disadvantages of using rules and regulations? Where you go? Oh, I think it was the blooming bracelets that the boys wore. Oh, you know the, the, the ropes? They put ropes around their arms. Oh, I think I think knotted, knotted ropes yeah. around their arms. Right? And for some, it was it's a religious cultural thing, in which case you had to have a letter from home to say, you know, that's what it was. Others, it was just, no, this is just trendy. Yeah? But of course, they'd have long sleeves. You can't see it. Yeah. Then it was the sports players who had those plumbing plastic bracelets with the magnets in them. I wear this for my sports because it keeps me balanced, therefore, I can play better. I'm not kidding you. That's how they were marketed. And do you know how much some of them cost? 120 New Zealand dollars each. Multiply that by four to get Malaysian ringgit. Four yes. All right. And these were rugby boys, so they're thinking that this is going to give them an advantage because you know they throw the ball and then they run, and somehow these magnets keep them balanced. Now I know you think that's mental, right? But the other week, and I say other week, I am talking possibly close to a year ago, okay? In IOI Mall, there was a shop selling the new version of those same bracelets. All right? These ones also had, I think, silver in them as well, because that does something to help your golf. It was a golf shop. It helps your golf performance. Yeah? Golfing people in the room? No? You're aware that there is a sport called golf? Uh, I, I don't need to play golf, but either you have to be incredibly superstitious or you're absolutely nothing. I'm with you on that. But dude, there is an entire product line of compression gear with silver 
embedded in it. That costs probably 400 times more than the original compression gear because they believe the silver does something. Silver does have certain qualities. I'm trying to say. They run faster. I know. So it's just honestly, and I was taking these bracelets off these players, and these were rugby boys. These were, you know, the size of a small house. Oh, but it helps me on my rugby. You can get it back at the end of the day. Oh, okay. I'll tell you, you try doing that. Let's see how brave you are. All right, okay. Now, ladies, yes, ladies and gentlemen, we're actually going to finish there for the day. Okay, um, there is pink stuff for your desk, blue stuff for your hands. This will give you a few minutes to clean and then head off to your next lesson. All right, please take your books with you. My advice write your name on them so that people know whose they are. That would be quite an important thing. Otherwise, as we'd say in the land of my birth, they call it up. Please goodbye for now. Have a great day, and we will see you again on next term. Next term. Cool. Have a good trip. Have a good break. Please pay attention to the classroom because you know I might post something up there. Never know. All right, we didn't quite get to the end of this, but we'll get there soon. All right, uh, Wait, Mr. David. Huh? I just found it interesting to punch out. Are we done with this topic then? This market uh, 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 topic? Or are we not? Uh, we've still got a little bit more to do in the market value topic. Okay. And, and then we we'll move on to our next topic. Okay. Thank you. Okay. See you next time. See you next time. All right. Thank you. Have a good Christmas, team. See you next time. Thank you.